Fight for the genuine gospel and its fruits. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Fight. That's what Timothy is told to do by Paul. And I want you to think about the word fight and how it settles into your heart. I suspect that for many of you, the idea of fighting is not a pleasant one. In fact, I'd be pleased if that's the case. It is our nature as Christians to seek peace. Our Savior Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We are called to be at peace with all people as far as it's possible. But we cannot be at peace when the gospel is at stake. When people are compromising the eternal message of the gospel, then you and I must fight for it. We must contend for it. Jesus was a man of peace, but in the temple, when he saw the perversion of worship and prayer, he became enraged, and twice he cleansed the temple in anger. Paul is going to say to Timothy, the situation in Ephesus is out of control, and the gospel is being compromised, and souls are at stake. And so Timothy is called to fight for the genuine gospel and its fruits, just as we are today. Now, we only fight when it's a serious situation, and I'm going to read the text for you, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, and I want you to hear how serious the situation is. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love for a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or about the matters about which they make confident assertions. It's a serious situation, we can see that in four points here. Four ways we can know that the gospel is being attacked and that life or death is occurring here. Number one, Paul repeats a command to Timothy. He had already said to Timothy, stay here and fix the situation. And in verse three, he says, as I urged you, past tense, Timothy, I'm telling you a second time in writing what I've told you in person. Now, you and I know that when we repeat ourselves, repeat ourselves, repeat ourselves, it's for emphasis, right? When you're around small children, don't you often have to repeat yourself again and again and again for emphasis so you can keep their attention and remind them? Here, Paul says to Timothy, it's so important, I don't mind at the beginning of the letter telling you again, stay and silence. Protect the gospel, Timothy. Remain there and contend for the faith. There's a repeated command. We also know it's a serious situation because it's the priority. Now, there are many amazing things in 1 Timothy. And there are many positive things. Paul's going to talk about prayer. Paul's going to talk about women in ministry. Paul's going to talk about elders and deacons, widows, managing your wealth wisely, how you spend your time, how you relate to the culture around you. There are many positive themes in 1 Timothy. But notice that the first thing he says to Timothy is fight. And in the middle of the letter, he's going to say it again. And at the end of the letter, he's going to say the same thing. Priority, choice of place in this letter is the situation there. It's the beginning, middle, end of this letter. And so by the priority and the repetition, we know this is a serious situation. Number three, there's something missing here. So verse two, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, as I urged you, you know what's missing? Well, if you read a lot of the Apostle Paul, you do. Paul almost always gives thanksgiving. It is very common for Paul to say, I thank God for you. Even those Corinthians, 
those sinning, secular, messed up Christians in Corinth, where incest is occurring in the church, even there, Paul can say, I thank God for you, Corinthians. He can thank God for the Philippians. He can thank God for the Christians in Thessalonica. He can thank God for Christians in many places, but there are two churches where the situation is so serious, he doesn't thank God for them. Galatia and here in Ephesus. We don't expect in an emergency for people to be cordial. I imagine that firemen rushing into a burning building don't hold the door for each other, and they certainly don't say, thank you. We don't expect police who are trying to apprehend a suspect to say, put the gun down, please. I thank you for putting the gun down. Right? In an emergency situation, you don't have time for cordialities. And so here, Paul doesn't thank God for them because he immediately jumps in and says, this is the situation. There's no thanksgiving for the Thessalonian church. And fourth, it's fulfilled prophecy. This is really tragic because Paul told them this would happen. Five years before, Paul had come through Ephesus on his last missionary journey, and he had gathered the Ephesian elders. This is beautifully described for us in Acts chapter 20. And he said to the elders, to the leaders, go the pastors if you want, or overseers, he had said to the leaders, be careful, danger's coming. Let me read that to you. This is a five years before, it's a prophecy. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw the way disciples after them. Five years before, Paul said to the church leaders, pay attention, be careful, be on guard because there will be men who will rise up from within this church and will teach the wrong gospel. They'll mess up the gospel and you as leaders, you need to protect the flock. You need to confront them. You need to win them back. You need to be on alert because danger's coming. Wolves will be among you. Paul had warned them. That was his warning to the Ephesian elders. And now five years later, Paul is declaring war on the Ephesian elders. Now, not all the leaders in Ephesus are messed up, but some are. And for whatever reason, the faithful, loving elders haven't been able to silence the ones that are messed up. And so Paul says to Timothy, that's your job. Even if you have to call them down publicly in a church service, even if you have to rebuke them in the name of the Lord and in my apostolic authority, you must silence them because they're doing harm. So it's a serious situation when you and I are called to fight for the gospel. We don't do it happily. We don't go looking for a fight. We're peacemakers. But in a serious situation, Ephesus, where Paul has to repeat the command to Timothy, where it's the priority of the letter, where there's no thanksgiving, and where it's prophecy fulfilled, Timothy must fight. It's a serious situation. You know, I don't know in the short term if Timothy was able to turn it around in Ephesus, maybe he was. But we know that many years later, another apostle has to address the Ephesians. It's quite famous in the book of Revelation. The apostle John writes a letter to the seven churches of Asia, and he writes a letter to the church of Ephesus. And he says many kind things about them. But you remember what he says? I have this against you that you have left your first love. You've left your love for Jesus. You've grown cold, Ephesians. And so whether Timothy is able to turn them around for a while, we know that this church had problems in the past, present, and the future. It's a serious situation. Well, what's going on? Why is it so serious? Pastor, how would we know whether somebody is messed up in their preaching? Well, strange speculation. Because verse 4, Paul says nor to pay attention to myths and genealogies. They are not to teach strange doctrines, nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. They are speculating. They are saying things that they don't know if they're true. And it's small stuff. It's triviality. When he mentions myths and endless genealogies, he's probably referring to Jewish stories that are growing up around the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus has to contend with the Jews, and he has to say... That's not actually what the Old Testament says. That's what you say the Old Testament says. 
it's human nature to add folklore and stories and details over time. And so it wasn't that Jesus was arguing against the Old Testament. He was arguing against the Old Testament misunderstood and perverted by tradition. In the same way, the Jews had added some folklore, some stories to the Old Testament. Probably it's the book of Jubilees, which was the Jewish book that was full of extra details. You know, sometimes we get in trouble with our human curiosity. It's been said that curiosity kills the cat. Curiosity can kill Christians. Sometimes we want to know just a little bit more than God wants us to know. And so the Jews had books like this, the book of Jubilees, that came along and said, have you ever wanted to know? Well, we'll tell you. Now, the Jews rightly knew this wasn't scripture. No Jew ever called the book of Jubilees scripture, but they liked it. Let me give you some examples of some unusual things in that book. That book purports to tell you the names of Adam's children. So if you were a Jew and you were reading along in Genesis and you thought, I really wish I knew the names of Adam's children, his sons and daughters. Well, here's a Jewish book to tell you what they were. Well, the problem is that God didn't tell us. It wasn't revealed to us. It wasn't written down. It wasn't inspired. And what God has not written down, you and I should not speak about. It doesn't matter whether the names are right. It's not scripture. And you and I are to be only proclaiming God's truth. Here's another one, a little more odd. We, we have this story in Exodus where, where baby Moses is taken by his mother and put in the basket of pitch and he's left by the riverside and God brings Pharaoh's daughter there. Well, the book of Jubilees wants you to think that Moses lingered on that riverbank for seven days. And birds came to eat this baby, and here's mighty Mary and his sister. And for seven days, she defends Moses, the baby, against the birds. His big, older, tough sister. See, what an example of a Jewish woman of faith. She defends her baby brother for seven days, and then the Pharaoh's daughter comes. Well, that makes for an interesting Hollywood movie. It makes for an interesting bedtime story, but it's not scripture. And these Christian teachers have fallen into relating all these old myths and genealogies. It's folklore. It would be attractive. Every country does it. Uh, they do it about their founding fathers. The Jews did it too. How old were you when you heard the story about George Washington and the cherry tree? Uh, what a great story about our founding father, right? That, that when his father asked him if he cuts down the cherry tree, he says, I cannot tell a lie. I mean, wouldn't you want to say to your children, be like George Washington? Oh, look at him. He's so honest. What a great story. And what a terrible myth. It was never true. Everybody knew it wasn't true. But a bookseller wrote this down in a book to make money. And so this story was told to children. Be like George Washington. Be honest. Be of character, be a good American, but it's American folklore. Everybody knows that story's not true. Well, that's okay a little bit with history, right? We know what that myth probably hasn't hurt anybody. But if you add myths to the gospel proclamation, if you muddy the waters, you could cost somebody their eternity. You see, these false teachers get an F. Paul says that their disease they bring is like gangrene that rots the flesh. And Paul makes it quite clear that unless they repent, they won't be in heaven. Look at the end of the chapter. Chapter 1, verse 20. He names names. Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan. So he taught not to blaspheme. Paul excommunicates them. He says, I have handed these two false teachers over to Satan that they might be saved. You see, the goal of casting them out of Christian fellowship is that they might repent. The idea of putting them outside the protection of the church where Satan can torment them is to maybe save their souls. So understand here that by adding to the gospel, by, by dabbling in small stories, by messing up the purity of the gospel, they have endangered their own souls and the souls of their hearers. If we were in school, we would give them an F. Uh, because we mentioned American history, I think of a arrogant, pompous, devilish, devil-filled young 16-year-old named Joseph Smith who had a vivid, wild imagination. 
And not content with the Bible stories he'd heard growing up, he began to imagine things like the Jews, the ancient Jews, had actually come to America and had lived on this continent. And there's Jesus appearing to them, and he wrote the Book of Mormon based upon myth. Now, people say, well, Mormons are Christians. Well, well, no, they're not, because they have all this other stuff that messes up the gospel. Mythology doesn't save souls. We would give Joseph Smith an F. You won't see him in heaven. Those are false teachers. But but before I, I relieve us and say in our evangelical churches today we don't do this, maybe we should talk about faulty teachers. Here, I'm not thinking about teachers that are false teachers. I'm thinking about people who mess things up. You see, you and I can make mistakes. We could almost do this if we got off focus. So I thought about some other letter grades we could give for faulty teachers. We give a C to preachers who major on minors, who might take a biblical doctrine, but they make it too big. All over Sunday or every month, you know that church is going to hear that pastor rant and rave about this social issue. Or some little minor Bible detail. There's a wonderful church and a wonderful pastor, Christy, I know of, but they had a problem every Christmas. Every Christmas, this pastor would pull out this obscure argument and kind of mess up the joyful Christian spirit, Christmas spirit. So his point was angels never sing, so humans have to. That's our privilege. And he would say, well, it does say in the Luke account, the angels were praising God. And he would say, well, the angels weren't singing, they were speaking. Hark the herald angel speak. Now, let's be gracious here. It doesn't say they were singing. We assume that because in the Old Testament, to praise God was to sing. And so I would say quite confidently, I'm sure those angels were singing, but the point is that if you spend December disturbing your people by ranting and raving that angels don't sing and that everybody's got it wrong, you ruin the joy of Jesus. If you take a minor point and you make it a major point, you get a C. You're off track. You're not far from those who pervert the gospel. You don't want to see. You want to do better as a preacher. Or a D, I think of pastors who spend all the time speculating. They tell their people in vivid detail, in times. They say, and then this will happen, and this will happen, and every third sermon is the end times, and the Antichrist, and the rapture. They're obsessed with the future, which is really interesting to me because all of them believe in a rapture, and they think their church isn't going to be there. So on Sunday morning, they stand up and say, it won't matter, you won't be there, it won't pertain to you, but... Just because I want to titillate your imagination, let me tell you how it'll be. You see the misfocus? God doesn't want us to know the details of the future. He wants us to prepare for the future. Pastors who get speculative and spend all the time trying to reveal all these details are guilty of the same issue. The end times craze. Trying to read Bible codes. Trying to decide if there's aliens. No, we preach Jesus and himself crucified. Now, it's a serious situation. It's a speculative situation. There's strange speculation occurring. Let's zero in and see some sins here. What is it specifically these false teachers are doing wrong? And this is important because I have to tell you, I hear it as a pastor. People will say, well, that pastor's off. I mean, I know he's not teaching the Bible, but what's it hurt? It's okay. I mean, you know, he's a good man. Or, you know, that that person on television, she's a little bit of a fraud, you know, but but what does it hurt? I mean, I just listened to her and it's okay. I promise in our zip code that there are pastors, men and women who stand up on Sunday mornings and they teach the wrong gospel. They teach another gospel and sweet people in Southern Illinois just smile at them like, I like you, you're a nice person, you're kind to me. See, what's the sin in false teaching? What is it that makes this so bad? Because you and I need to be willing to fight when the gospel is compromised. I see four sins here. Number one, they're starving the flock. They're starving the flock. Elders, preachers, are called to feed the sheep. That's what Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. We're to give gospel truth. We're to give biblical truth that makes people grow. There's only a limited amount of time to teach, isn't there? For Christians, there's only a limited amount of time to learn and listen. 
there's only a limited amount of space in our brains, right? So if you're not teaching the good stuff, but you're filling people's minds with the irrelevant minor details, you're starving them. I'm sure a slice of pie every week isn't going to hurt you. I'm sure candy occasionally is not going to hurt you. I'm sure that something sweet at the end of your meal won't hurt you. After you've eaten your healthy food, a little bit of something sweet won't hurt you. But if you flip the food pyramid, so that most of what you eat is candy and sugar and desserts, and you eat very little nutritious stuff, you'll starve, right? A preacher who spends all of his time or her time talking about things that are not Jesus, the gospel, gospel applications, they don't go through Bible verses, they tell stories and speculations, they starve the flock. Christians there need milk and meat, and they get junk food. You starve the flock. Just because you're not teaching something is necessarily wrong doesn't mean you're not starving your people. The gospel feeds our souls. The second thing they do is they're being arrogant in their ignorance. Arrogant teaching from in ignorance. Verse 7, notice what Paul says at the end. They want to be teachers even though they do not understand even what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Paul says that they don't really know. They don't really understand the gospel. They don't really understand what the Bible teaches. And instead of being humbled and coming to learn, they puff themselves up and appoint themselves as teachers. Listen, the Holy Spirit hides the truths of God from unbelievers. No unbeliever can read the Bible and understand the deep truths of God. They are revealed to a spiritual man. Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 1, the natural man does not receive the things of God. All an unbeliever can understand is that Jesus died for their sins and they can understand enough to be saved. That's great. But they can't understand the deep truths of the Bible. That takes the Holy Spirit within them working through a holy believer. And so these false teachers are not Christians. They don't have the Holy Spirit of God and they're idiots when it comes to the Bible. They read it, they hear it, and they just can't get it. They're in a spiritual stupor. They can't get it, and then they have the arrogance to stand up and teach what they don't understand. In fact, they're probably deceived, and they don't even know what they don't know. You see, the Bible is easy for us to understand, but you have to come to it humbly. You have to come to it without a hurry. And you have to depend upon the Holy Spirit of God. You have to be living a holy Christian life for the Holy Spirit of God to guide you. So you can be a young Christian or an old Christian. Anyone can understand the Bible. And as God empowers them over time, anyone can teach. In fact, we're all called to teach. But you can't teach if you're arrogant and ignorant. They starve the flock. Arrogant teaching from ignorance. And then I see selfish pride. Paul says in the Ephesian warning, Acts 20, verse 30. They will distort the truth. Why? In order to draw away the disciples after them. May I say to you, as someone who preaches for a living, it's tempting, isn't it? To stand up every Sunday and say, glory to God, Jesus is great, focus on him. You know what the temptation is? Think about yourself. Paul's teachers run on this. I want to look good. I want my own followers. I want people to hang on every word that comes out of my mouth. And so I'll raise my voice and I'll extend my hand and I'll, I'll strut around and I will have followers and people will love me. That's the temptation every preacher faces. And Paul says these false teachers will do all they do. They'll pervert the gospel that they might have their own followers. They want to steal sheep from Jesus. Instead of Jesus is great, oh, you're a great pastor. Instead of glory to God, well, some glory to me. See, they're glory grabbers, they're thieves. They would like to have their own followers. They put their pictures in the backs of their books. They, they make sure you know the name of the ministry. They strut around today, and everybody knows their name. And everybody follows on every word they say. And if you listen to them, there's not much about Jesus. And it was then there. In Ephesus, these are self-appointed little messiahs running around. 
And they give lip service to Jesus, but it's all about them and their teaching. You see, they're driven by selfish pride. Our model is John the Baptist, who said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. The goal of humble gospel preaching is to make Jesus great and us his little servants. It's to lift God up and lower ourselves. It's to step out of the spotlight and point to Jesus. John the Baptist, he must increase, but I must decrease. And false teachers say, he must decrease, and I might increase. Number four is provoking fights. We see that in the end of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, where Paul says they get into fights, and they provoke fights. Listen, you know what happens when you put two arrogant people together. They get into a fight, right? When you take two people who think they're awesome and you put them together, you're going to have contention. So what happens when Mr. Know-it-all meets Mr. Know-it-all at church? Well, they get into a fight because they're all grabbing for the glory that belongs to Jesus alone. And so these arrogant, ignorant teachers stand up and they teach, and guess what? They fight with each other. There's contention and debate. They, they take arm against each other and the Christians who are listening to them get divided. Listen, there might be Occasionally, a reason why a church is split. But almost all church splits are driven by arrogant teachers. And the church isn't big enough for both of them. And so they divide the church. One group goes here, one group goes there. You see, it produces contention and fighting. And so we see the sins here. Starving the flock by not giving them gospel meat. Arrogant teaching from ignorance. Selfish pride provoking fights. And then Paul goes to the good news. And this is where we'll linger. Paul doesn't just go on the offense, on defense, he goes on the offense. He says to Timothy, now, you know that when you teach Timothy, this is what you should be aiming for. It's not just negatives, because again, what's happening is these false teachers aren't doing what's right, they're doing what's wrong. And so Paul says to Timothy, let's review, Timothy, what the goal of your teaching is. That's the but of verse 5. But the goal of our instruction, Timothy, is three things. Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And so let's think about how the gospel and its genuine fruits do this. What does it mean by pure love? That's a sincere love. It means that you really do love God and love other people. That's the cardinal Christian virtue, right? If you don't have love, you have nothing. It means that the motivation for all that you do is love. So duty's great. Uh, you know, I admire Christians who say, well, I didn't want to go to church on Sunday. I was tired, but it was right to do. It was my duty. Well, that's good. But your motivation for going to church on a regular basis should be love for Jesus. Uh, when you greet people on Sunday morning, it shouldn't be because you ought to. It's because you want to. When you take care of your family, it shouldn't be some sort of obligation because you made a promise to God. It should be because you want to. Good gospel teaching, one of the fruits is love. As you hear the gospel over and over again and gospel applications, you and I learn to be more loving. Good teaching will produce pure love. Just like false teaching produces self-love. If you hear false teaching, it focuses on you. Follow your heart. You can do anything. You're awesome. But true gospel teaching says, look to Jesus. Look to his love for you and be loving likewise. One of the fruits, genuine fruits of gospel teaching is pure love. The second one is good conscience. The goal of our teaching, Timothy, is a good conscience. Now your conscience is your inner moral compass. It's that voice in your head that's always talking to you. Interestingly, unbelievers and believers both have a conscience. Everybody has a Jiminy Cricket. Everybody has a voice inside that says, you should, you shouldn't. Yes, no. You should be proud of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself. And what Paul says is when you teach the gospel, People get a good conscience. They get a, a wise conscience. They begin to have discernment. Have you thought about that? 
As much as we teach and preach, as much as we instruct Christians, I can't prepare you for every situation you're going to face. The Bible actually doesn't have an explicit answer to every question. Think of some of the biomedical ethical questions that exist today. And so you're going to get into situations where you don't know exactly what the Bible teaches, or maybe the Bible doesn't teach it directly, and you're going to have to say, what does God want me to do? That's discernment. In this situation, in this relationship, in this financial deal, what does God want me to do? You have a free day to yourself. What does God want me to do? That's discernment. And when you hear good gospel teaching, it tunes up your conscience, and the Holy Spirit works through your conscience, and you can follow your heart. You can follow your conscience as its spirit infused, as the spirit empowers it because you're hearing good teaching. Get up in the morning, pray, read your Bible, seek God, and then do what you want to do the rest of the day because it'll be discernment from the Holy Spirit. A good conscience versus doing things that you don't agree with. So the hypocrite knows the right thing to do but doesn't do it, or to do things with doubt. A good conscience is a precious gift, isn't it? To say, I know that what I'm doing is right. Good gospel teaching will produce that. It'll give you pure love, a good conscience. If you send it a false teaching, please hear me. Even if you know it's wrong and you're just tolerating it, if you set under good, uh, I'm sorry, if you set under godless, false teaching, it will mess up your conscience. Every Christian who tolerates false teaching will sin in their own personal life, guaranteed. Because the Holy Spirit within you is grieved. And if you grieve the Holy Spirit of God by listening to idiocy and falsehoods and Jesus diminishing things, guess what? Your discernment will get messed up. Your conscience will get messed up. Paul will say later of the leaders in 1 Timothy 4, these false leaders, that they have a conscience that's been seared or cauterized. It doesn't work anymore. It's been burned. It's been damaged. And so you and I learn discernment and a good conscience by gospel teaching. And if we set our false teaching, we'll have a bad conscience and a seared response to the Lord. And the third one is sincere faith. The goal of our teaching, Timothy, is pure love, good conscience, and a sincere faith. Faith is simply trusting God, isn't it? It's where I say, I'm afraid, but I'll trust you, God. Uh, I know what you're saying I should do, but no one's going to like it, but I'll do it anyway. Faith is trusting God, and trusting God is treasuring God. And so when we have a sincere faith and we say, God, I'm just a little child, but I will do whatever you ask me to do, that's a sincere faith. It's the true trust in God. And it's shown by our life, not just our lips. Anyone can say on Sunday morning, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus and I live a good life. But it's that what you do on Tuesday matches what you say and do on Sunday. Your words lead to your works. Your affirmations match your attitudes, match your actions, and change the atmosphere around you. It's consistency. You know that old charge against the church that's full of hypocrites? Well, although I think that's a funny charge because it's always said by hypocrites themselves, this is guarding against this. So when people meet us, they say, you know what? I don't believe in their Jesus, but I'll tell you this. They do, and what they believe, that's how they behave. Pure love, good conscience, sincere faith. Let's begin our applications here. I want to begin the application with you, the listener, and then I'm going to turn the spotlight on preachers. I'm going to put my profession and myself in the hot seat. Three questions for you. Do you have pure love? Could you say, everybody I greeted today, I did it because I love them. And everything I did this week, every sacrifice I made, every statement I made, I did it because I love Jesus. I did everything this week out of love. Probably not. Any of us could say that, right? We'd say, well, mostly love or are mostly out of care for Jesus. You and I could ask God today, we could say, Lord, the goal of the gospel is pure love, a pure heart. Would you purify my heart this morning? Would you help me love more and do duty less? The second question is about a good conscience. 
That is, are you living in guilt? And there's three ways you can be living in guilt. One is you could not be a Christian. You, you, could, be one, you could be in the same spot as one of these false teachers. You might say, I have a guilty conscience before God. Well, the reason why is because you don't believe in Jesus. The gospel gives a good conscience. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, if you haven't repented and called upon his name, you should have a guilty conscience. Right? The conscience is warning you. It's warning. It's the flashing light of the dash. You are about to be destroyed. And so if your conscience is guilty this morning because you are godless and not a Christian, you need to receive the gospel this morning. You can turn off this broadcast in a minute or walk out the door of the church and have a good conscience because Jesus has cleansed it. Or you could be a Christian and you're walking with the Lord, but Satan's tormenting you. He's casting doubts on you. He's reminding you of all these things you've done. And you need to remember this morning that you're saved by grace. And you need to let go of that guilt. It's false guilt. Or the third category is you're a Christian and you're doing things you shouldn't do. You're dabbling in gray areas. You'd say, I've got this issue in my life, and either I know I shouldn't be doing it, or I don't know, and I do it anyway. Hear me. Anything you do and you don't know if it's right is automatically evil. If you don't know if you should be doing that, Christian, if you're not sure what God thinks about it and you do it anyway, that's blatant rebellion. You're basically saying, God, I don't really care what you think. I'm going to do it anyway. So you might be dabbling in gray areas. You might be right on the edge. You need to repent. You need to ask a pastor. You need to search the Bible. You need to find out if that's okay for you to be doing. You need to let go of it. You should do everything that you do in a way that you could say, God, I thank you right now. I thank you for the privilege of doing. Amen. And sincere faith. Trusting God. How are you doing versus your fears? Your anxieties? Your uncertainty? Are you trusting him more than you did last year, even last week? You could this morning say, God, I need more trust in you. That's three questions for you based upon the goal of the gospel. So now I don't want to linger here, but I do want to turn the spotlight back on my preaching professions and say, there are five ways you can evaluate teaching and preaching. God is so gracious that he says to you, Christians, if you read your Bibles, you'll know whether you've got a good preacher or teacher. Five things you can always ask. Number one, how much of what they speak is from God? That is, how much of what she or he speaks is from the Bible? What percentage is God and what percentage is them? And let me tell you, preachers get really popular by filling the words with themselves. They tell funny stories. They tell jokes. They're entertaining. They talk so much about everything that pertains to them not God. The mark of a genuine gospel teacher is they talk very little about themselves and a lot about Jesus. They spend their time in God's word and what you hear from them is God's word and they actually teach. What percentage is directly from God's word versus what percentage is from the preacher? Now I know we have to add some details and some illustrations. I know we have to help you be engaged in it but May you, may you sit under prayer preaching of the word. Is the sermon more about Jesus or more about the preacher? Is the sermon more about Jesus or about the latest social issue? Is it more about wisdom or more about Washington? Does the preacher manipulate your heart, jerking it around with stories and inflections of his voice? Or does he appeal to your heart through your head, which is the gospel? Number two, the result of good preaching is love produced. How much love is being produced because of that preaching? Is the church becoming more loving or less loving? Number three, how much obedience is being produced? Do Christians who come to that church become more obedient? Do they obey God more? Do they love Jesus more in their daily life because of the preaching? And if they don't, something's wrong. Number four, how much joy is produced? Listen, you can tell. You, you walk into church where the gospel is preached and Christians are full of joy. You walk into church where the gospel is not preached and it's dead. It's dead. There's no joy if there's no Jesus proclaimed. And finally, worship. 
Will attending that church, will sitting under that pastor's teaching, will they help you to worship Jesus more? Because isn't that our destiny someday? That we're all going to heaven, trusting the gospel to worship, bless Jesus forever.